Thanks so much, everyone, for coming this evening and um, uh, to the Guardians of Nature. And these are twice a month uh, hosted forums and work sessions uh, where um, the public and members of Audubon chapters, uh, anyone who would like to participate, uh, it can work together remotely and hopefully soon face-to-face -face on projects to uh, address climate change and help respond in constructive ways to uh, bird and habitat conservation. So as we say on the slide in front of you, with your input, we're creating programs to connect and educate the public about birds and wildlife conservation. And that's my dog next to me. <laughs> um, and I'm Betsy O'Hagan, and I welcome you. Um, today's schedule is in front of you on the slide. So we're starting now a few minutes after 7, so we're waiting for everyone to come. And um, we've recently added in um, speakers, uh, just short, brief uh, introductions, conversations, <coughs> presentations, forums, whatever people want to do, um, in, in hopes of, uh, of course, building our connections, strengthening our networks, and connecting to new conversations about um, all things green and uh, enterprise being built and constructed uh, in these new opportunities uh, for business development between uh, enterprise development and green uh, green things and sustainability. So uh, without, you know, we want to get going. And so Daniel Brown, who's co-founder of Rust Belt Writers, uh, which is based here in the Northeast Ohio region, opens our session with a new conversation about entrepreneurship and green business. So this, this time for us together is approximately 30 minutes. It's a time for meet and greet, for stories, share insights and tips. Um, basically to um, get to know each other and how to learn how we can work together and how can we create business um, in these areas of new opportunities. Uh, and then after Dan finishes, we're going to uh, process right straight into project work. And I have a list of projects for you on a subsequent slide. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. Rust Belt Writers, again, Daniel Brown, co-founder. And before I allow Dan to get started, I just wanted to slip in a couple photos. Now, I live on the near west side of Cleveland, and I was walking my dog, Roko, the other day. And uh, there, lo and behold, was a Rust Belt Writers van. And here's what we saw when we were walking. Um, so I never like to, I like to take advantage of every opportunity. So this was one to capture some photos and to get to know the driver. Now, Dan, who, who is that? Uh, that's Liana Rivera. All right. All right. And we'll, we'll hear more about this. Um, yeah. And so this is what I saw. And I wanted to share it with you. And she was so sweet. She came out, and I asked her to open up the van, which she did, so I could get a couple photos. And that's what the inside of one of those vans looks like. And those containers are what and how compost, right, and everything is collected. Yep. Dan, do you have, I'm sure you have to add to that. Yeah, no, I, um, you, you've got it all accurate thus far, so I'll, I'll okay. let you keep rolling. All right, all right. And so um, one of the homes, the lovely homes on the street, uh, you see this great, awesome sign, we compost in the front of their yard. And then that's their bucket um, that's put out to be collected, I, I guess. So, But we're going to learn more about this. I thought the signage was awesome and totally cool because it explains everything I wanted to know uh, to sort of you know, address my curiosity about what was this all about. Who is Rust, Rider, Rust Belt Riders, and what is this about composting? Um, and, of course, I want to go back just for a second. I love the um, descriptive tag, feed people, not landfills. That's so courageous and bold, and I could really immediately, um, you know, align with that. Um, these are um, Rust Belt Riders photos, and... Uh, um, communicating on the left, checking temperatures, and I'm sure Dan will talk some more about this, uh, for compost as it matures, and uh, then testing the samples, the soil samples, um, and 
this is uh, a building, their building, and where it is. And here's some of the action that goes into um, creating and generating uh, the compost, helping it to um, break down and turning it into soil. And here's another photo. These are all Rust Belt Rider photos, um, bringing uh, compost in. And then I really love the photo on the right, um, showing us more about, you know, what does that look like? What's the next step? Um, how does this all happen? How does this all take place? And so you can see the trash cans with the signage again. Nice, clear, and simple instructions. And also promoting and, and bring educating. You know, uh, as the, you can read on the sign that's, um, that says under the compost drop up, over 40% over of all food ends up in a landfill, but it doesn't have to. So that's really great. Here's their logo, keep an eye out for it. And on the right, you can find these images all that explain more about the services that they offer um, on Facebook and on social media and of course at their website, which the link is listed below, www.rustbeltriders.com. Now with that, I'm going to turn the screen over to Dan. And Dan, I will send you a invite Great. And um, then you can take it away. Perfect. All right. But that'll set you up with some images about Rust Belt Riders and green business that's right here. <clears throat> All right. Thank you, Dan. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for that. That's super helpful. Um, um, I just have to install an extension really quick. Okay, no problem. Great. Who composts? Is there anyone who composts here? Nancy does. Drina does. Awesome. Good. And I know we have another board, WCAS board member who composts and who is uh, in your network, Dan. Oh, that's great. And they just, the family just started it. They love it. Um, and they're so happy to be able to do it. Betsy, could you resend that to me? I just installed I the extension, and I think Got I it. should be able to do it now. Good. All right. Here it comes. Okay. I didn't realize Rust Belt Riders did curbside pickup. Is that uh, Maybe that's something new that you'll talk about. Yeah, it is, it is, an, it is newer for us. Um, and I will. Now, while Dan's getting organized, we are with 7:14. I like to be stay within our time, so um, so we will go a little past uh, 7:30 because we're starting late and Dan's just getting started now. If you don't mind. Okay. So can you all see my screen now? Yes. Yes. Awesome. So yeah. So I'll I'll give you the the overview of who we are, what we do, and sort of why we do it. Um, Betsy set me up nicely, so um, a lot of this will just be some additional context. Um, so as was mentioned, uh, I'm one of the founders of Rust Belt Riders. Um, our name, we often get the question of why is, your, why is that your name? Um, and so when we first got started back in 2014, um, we we didn't really know what we were doing, uh, but my, myself and business partner were working at a, a restaurant at the time and running a community garden in our spare time, uh, mm -hmm. and we wanted to find a way to connect this idea of the farm-to-table movement to build out a table-to-farm movement. Um, in trying to run our own community garden, we struggled mightily to get anything to grow, and so what we realized was that what we needed was uh, to improve our soil. Um, and the best way that we could think to do that was to find a way to get food scraps from restaurants to community gardens. And so we raised a couple hundred dollars and got a bicycle and a welded a trailer to the back of that bicycle um, and literally began riding around Cleveland, uh, picking up food scraps 300 pounds at a time. Um, and so um, that and we want to take some poetic 
license with allowing people to reimagine what our region, the Rust Belt, can be. Um, I, get, I take a lot of pride and joy when people, you know, uh, in shorthand refer to us as Rust Belt, right? Because I think that too long it's been perceived as deindustrialization, polluting, um, uh, bad things, right? And we want to change people's perception that the Rust Belt can be an amazingly beautiful place. Um, and so a lot of our work is really focused, I mean, we think about ourselves as a climate solutions company. Um, so uh, climate change is obviously an existential crisis that we are presented with, and oftentimes it leaves people not knowing exactly how to act or what to do. Um, but I take a lot of solace in realizing that much of the trajectory and impacts of climate change have actually unfolded in my own lifetime. So in 1988, to date myself, um, the UN panel, uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was established, um, and yet in my, ho in my whole lifetime, in spite of knowing all of the science, um, very little has been done to uh, bring about uh, the level of urgency needed to rise to the occasion and challenge that the global climate crisis presents. And so as recently as 2019, that same body showed that we are on pace for another 1.5 degrees in Celsius rise before the end of the century. Um, and I think that um, it can be challenging to think about, like, what do I do in the face of climate change? Um, often we're presented with... Um, big, bold infrastructure plans that don't seem to relate to individuals. Um, and so when this report called Project Drawdown came out, um, it presented and reframed the climate crisis as an opportunity. Um, it's really easy to point to the things that lead to natural habitat erosion, uh, greenhouse gases, but it's a much harder challenge, I think, to begin thinking about the solutions to climate change. And so what this report sought to do was to look at the solutions that currently exist that can slow and reverse climate change. And so they took a sector-by-sector -sector analysis of the world's economy and found that the food and agriculture industry contains within it some of the greatest potential to not only slow but reverse climate change. Um, and when you... And that really runs in contrast to what most of popular media and sentiment would lead you to believe, right? Um, oftentimes it's um, install solar panels, drive a Tesla, somehow erect a, a wind turbine, right? Um, and oftentimes those are really cost prohibitive um, endeavors for people to do. But we all eat um, or we all strive to eat. Um, and we all have a relationship to with where our food comes from. Um, and what this report found was that we really need to be thinking about where our food goes because we waste quite a lot of food. Um, and the reason that food waste is such a significant driver of global climate uh, crisis is because of the land, energy, natural resources, and labor that not only goes into producing that food, but when food goes to landfill, it emits methane gas, which is a exceedingly potent uh, greenhouse gas that um, is a, a very dr drastic accelerator of, of climate uh, change. And I think it really goes to underscore just the scale of how much food waste there is. And this often catches a lot of pe people by surprise. Um, roughly 40%, as was mentioned on our sign, um, uh, of all food grown in the United States will end up being sent to landfill. Um, food and other organic material is actually the single largest component of what comprises our nation's landfills. Um, and if those aren't alarming enough statistics, this is happening at the exact same time when one in five children in Northeast Ohio do not know where their next meal is coming from. Um, and so for us, there's um, obviously a moral challenge at hand, right? Um, we, we live in a community and in a society where people don't have access to healthy, nutritious food. There's an economic cost to this. Um, annually, we'll spend something like $218 billion on the growing transportation and disposal of food that's never consumed. Um, and then there's a massive environmental impact. 
So the greenhouse gases associated with food entering landfills would make it the, the globe's third largest emitter only behind the United States or China. So when we think about what we can do in the face of climate change, in the face of hunger, in the face of economic um, hardship, um, I look at a banana peel very differently, right? Um, this can be uh, something that exacerbates um, problems or is the building blocks of solutions. Um, and so um, what we strive to do is really commit people to thinking creatively about how to minimize food waste from occurring in, to begin with. So we like to mention that food waste is a preventable problem and it's an, an ex exceedingly silly problem. Um, and can be prevented in a lot of different ways, like meal planning, eating seasonally, trying your hand at pickling and fermenting. Um, so we have this self-deprecating invitation to people to actively try to put us out of business. Because if there wasn't as much food waste, uh, there really wouldn't be a need for a company like ours. Uh, and yet there is, right? Because uh, pineapple tops are hard to consume. Um, Coffee grounds are also not all that enjoyable or palatable. And so when food waste does occur, because oftentimes it is inevitable, um, we want to be there to ensure that food never goes to landfills, um, because that is ultimately the very worst place for organic matter to go. So important, an important question to ask is who is wasting all of this food? Um, a report that came out in 2019 showed that 43% of all food waste occurs at the household level, while another 40% occurs at, at the business or sort of consumer facing level. And so those are the sectors that we really focus on, focus on serving um, through our services. And so we have, um, we first started by offering our services to, to businesses. And so what that looks like is a service very similar to that of a, of a recycling company. We provide containers and bins commensurate in size with the amount of material that we expect a business to produce over the course of a week. Uh, they put in all of their house, all of their food waste, and then we exchange that full bin for a clean, empty bin, uh, allowing for ongoing service. Um, we also try and go ab above and beyond, right? Uh, in addition to exchanging bins, which ensures that our service is clean, we weigh all of the material and run that through an EPA climate calculator so we can tell people in real time what kind of diversion they're achieving, uh, the greenhouse gas impacts that they're helping to prevent through the use of our services, and all of that helps our clients to tell their story of why they're doing this work and why they view it as important. So we actively work with over 250 businesses across Northeast Ohio on a weekly basis, um, ranging from small cafes to uh, healthcare facilities and universities. Um, but um, it was really um, the pandemic um, and the, the onset of the pandemic that forced us to uh, redirect our energy and our efforts to better serve our community because, well, businesses generate lots of food waste at one location or a few locations, uh, residents are also clamoring for services that allow them to compost if they don't have a yard, if they live in an apartment building, or if, like many people, they live an exceedingly busy life. Um, and so we have, um, as Betsy showed, uh, drop-off locations across Northeast Ohio. We currently have 13 different drop-off locations and the way that this service works is our members pay a, a nominal monthly fee of $10 to gain access to any of our drop-off locations where they can deposit their household food scraps um, on an ongoing basis. These drop-off locations are accessible 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, and as a member of our service, uh, you get free access to monthly workshops that we host on topics ranging from vermicompost to raised beds to seed starting and everything in between. Um, and then later I'll talk about what we do with all of this food waste because our clients get uh, discounts on all of the stuff that we make um, from their contribution of food scraps. Um, and as was mentioned, we, we also have a curbside service. So 
we realize that we live in an era of convenience um, and oftentimes people either have mobility challenges or um, drop off uh, a public drop off location isn't that appealing to them. So the pandemic really allowed us to uh, double down on this service um, as, a, as a means of reaching people where they are at. Um, so our pickup service allows us to come to your home once per week. We pr provide you with a bin as seen here in this photo. And then once a week, um, you put that out on your front step or at a location that somebody on our team could access. And we exchange that full bin for a clean empty bin. And just like our commercial clients, uh, we weigh all of this material and give you access to that data so you can see the impact that you're making through the use of our services. Um, similarly, you get discounts on our products, access to workshops, and hopefully feel like you're part of a community that is really invested in this kind of uh, service, which we believe should really be a utility in the same way that universal recycling ought to be. Um, but we also recognize that this is a, a relatively new thing for a lot of people. And because of the way that we compost, we're able to capture a wide range of different materials, um, including materials that you wouldn't otherwise necessarily want to compost in your own backyard. So because we're composting at a commercial scale, uh, we have the, the ability to process things like meat, bones, and dairy. Um, and so we worked with a developer to build out a searchable database that any of our members can use, whether you use our pickup or drop-off service. So you can search in real time to um, get answers to questions that you might have about whether or not this or that is in fact compostable. Because at the end of the day, we receive that material and we uh, are, need to be proper stewards of that material to make sure that it gets composted properly. Um, speaking of composting, so um, all of the material that we collect, and this year we expect that we will be able to uh, divert over 4 million pounds of food from going to landfills. Um, that requires quite a lot of processing um, to take place. So on the left, um, you see a overhead image. Uh, and then on the right, you see a far larger overhead image. Um, in uh, July of last year, we moved from our old site to our new site. Um, and that was in an attempt to process 100% of the material that we are collecting. Um, because when we do that, we can make products um, that we can make available to, our, to the public and to gardeners and farmers alike. Um, and we sell those products under the brand Tilth Soil. Uh, and we believe that it's really important to not just have a service and similarly not just have a product, but by having the combination of those two things, we can make both of them far more accessible than if either one of them were operating in isolation. So we brand our products as being made from food scraps, as being made right here in Cleveland. And then again, we're offering all of these products at a discount to people who use our services. So a very brief overview on composting. It seems like lots of you already do this. Um, but we think of composting as having four major components. Uh, your nitrogen, which uh, in our case is the food scraps that we collect. Your carbon, which is often leaves or wood chips. And then air is a critical component um, because what you're doing is fostering the microbial reproduction um, that uh, facilitates in the decomposition of organic matter. Um, so the incorporation of air ensures that we're not going to have a smelly mess on our hands um, and also uh, manifests itself by us turning these piles. So Betsy showed a photo of Nathan turning with a pitchfork a pile. That's incorporating air into our, into our compost. And then lastly is moisture. Um, you don't want a pile that's too wet, otherwise it will smell foul. Um, and you similarly don't want it too dry, otherwise you won't be creating a, a hospitable environment for microbes to reproduce and run their magic. So we take a lot of pride in making really high quality compost. Um, and we're actually recognized by the US Composting Council um, as being the best small scale composter in the United States in 2020. Um, and so 
all of that gets uh, that compost gets made and then blended into uh, very specific products for particular applications. And so we've got a potting mix, a raised bed fill mix. For those that love indoor house plants, we've got a mix for that. Um, and so the the blend that really like launched and validated that we were onto something was a blend that we call Sprout. This is a seed starting mix um, that allows people to uh, grow vegetables, herbs, or fruit from seed. Um, and early on, we wanted to determine whether or not what we were making was special. Um, and so we sent our, a sample of our product out to the University of Kentucky, who was doing a study at the time of commercially available uh, potting soils. And they concluded in an independent study that our product was among the highest performing available uh, organic potting mixes in the country. Um, and so that was really like a pep in our step and told us that we're on to something and if we can continue to create um, access to our services that allow people to divert food from going to landfills and similarly be, be making really high quality products, um, we think that we can begin to change the narrative around what's taking place in Northeast Ohio um, and uh, begin to radically, hopefully radically improve our region's food system, which uh, has a, a number of compounding beneficial impacts um, related to public health, um, economic well-being, job creation, um, and ultimately our ability to uh, put up a fight against the climate crisis. Um, so all of our products we, we make uh, and blend ourselves in, in independent, our compost facility is in Independence, and then our offices are in downtown Cleveland on St. Clair Avenue at, at 27th and St. Clair. Um, so that's where you can pick up bags of soil just like this. We have them in two different sizes. This is, here is our small bag, which is about 10 pounds per bag. And then we have a, a bigger bag, which is like 35 to 40 pounds. Um, and so this is all our attempt at advancing this thing called the circular economy, right? Um, it's, we say circular as a way of contrasting it with the economy we live in today, which is, you know, take, make, use, and throw away, and it becomes somebody else's problem. But what we want to build and see come to fruition is this idea where there is no waste. And food uh, and the food system, I think, is a really excellent – uh, experimentation ground for thinking about how you can and should be perpetually recycling um, this kind of material. And when you do, uh, you improve public health, you combat climate change, you create amazing place-based jobs <clears throat> that you can't go anywhere. Um, and and yeah, so that's that's what we do. I hope I didn't go too fast, um, but would love to. Uh, expound on anything if we've got time or answer any questions that any of you might have. Thank you, Dan. We have plenty of time. Does anyone have any questions? I do, Dan. This is Gloria Ferris. Thank you so much for your presentation. Yeah, thank um, you. Where would we find uh, your drop-off points? Um, yeah, so um, our website contains all the information on both the service area for our pickup uh, as well as all the various locations for our drop-off. Um, and is that the Rust Belt uh, Rust Belt yeah, Riders? Yeah, com. If you okay. can just tell me, like, where in town do you live? I might be able oh, to Oh, I live you. on the near west side. I live in um, near Old Brooklyn in Brooklyn Center. Okay, cool. Right so, by the zoo. Yeah, um, so we have um, a drop-off location in Tremont. We also have one in Fair uh, at uh, Fairview uh, Park. Is that right? Uh, Fairview Park City Hall, um, which also might be somewhat close to you. Um, Tremont. So I think those are those are probably the two closest ones to where you live. And then um, my second question is that if if you partake in in either the drop off or the curbside. Yep. Um, you said that there is it discounts that we get on the soil. Yep. Or so, how does that work? 
Yeah, absolutely. So so members who use either a pickup or drop off service um, get a 10% discount on any of the soils that we make um, from the food scraps that we compost. Okay. Yep. So you get a 10% discount. All That's right. right. And what you had another, uh, what's the tiltsoil.com yeah. website? Yeah, so so we, we thought it was um, advantageous. We think of Rust Belt Riders as the the service delivery arm and tilt soil is the products arm. And so okay. if you're what you're looking for is soil, tilt soil is the place to go. If you're interested in food waste diversion, Rust Belt Riders provides those services. I just I had peripherally known about you and felt that you provided a good service, but I'm really glad I uh joined tonight because it's really heartening to see how you've done something that is a circular economic thing and uh, I want to read that book because I want to know why women's and girl women and girls are like fourth on the list yeah, I'd like to no, understand that more <laughs> yeah it's it's a very fascinating um and insightful read um I'd love to chat your ear off about it at some point <laughs> well yeah, we'll do that sometime Dan. that sounds lovely <laughs> okay how about another question? Drina? You'll have to unmute yourself. I was uh, very interested in hearing about how you are able to use uh, uh, compost meat and other products. And I was wondering, um, is that has that becoming a bigger part of your market? And do you have any advice for us home co composters? Yeah. Um, so I think that one of the things we, we learned early on was that um, we needed to make our services as easy for people to use as possible. Um, and so um, in a backyard setting, you wouldn't include things like meat or dairy, but when you approach someone like the Cleveland Clinic, um, you need to make it very obvious, like, if it's food, it can go here, right? Um, <laughs> And so the reason that you often wouldn't compost meat or dairy or bones in your backyard pile is because there are pathogens that persist in uh, those kinds of proteins that require a higher temperature threshold to kill that you would need to further pasteurize and kill them off. And so okay. it's very difficult to reach temperature. So at a home pile, you want to reach have your compost reach or exceed 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, uh, but if you are including things like meat or dairy, you need to have temperatures meet or exceed 150 degrees. Um, it's hard to get to 130. It's much more difficult to get to 150. But because we this is literally our livelihood, um, we've gotten very good at maintaining those temperatures um, by very close analysis and uh, operations on them. As for um, tips for home composters, I think that one of the things that I find happens more often than not is that um, people will uh, very likely have way too much like kitchen scraps or food scraps in their pile and not nearly enough carbon. So the balance or ratio between your, your carbon and nitrogen um, should be roughly three or four to one, um, which is to say if you've got a bucket full of food scraps and you put that in your bin, you should be at the same time putting either three or four same size buckets of wood chips, sawdust, or leaves in that pile with it as well. Um, it's that ratio that um, will ensure the decomposition is off to the races and beyond that, again, monitoring for moisture and aeration. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? I know uh, Karu Tsuboni uh, um, is here, and uh, Karu is our chair for native plants. Oh, cool. Um, and is doing a <laughs> great job. And that is Sugumi, who is our very has been our very youngest um, member of WCIS even before she was born. That's so, awesome. 
Karu, do you have any questions? Or I know because you're actually the connector here, one of the connectors between um, uh, why good healthy soil is so important for uh, urban birding and the plants that uh, support the birds, whether they're residents or migrants. Uh -huh. So, Dan, thank you for your presentation. I, I wonder, you know, uh, how the business is. So that was a real, uh, good to know, like, uh, like how business is focusing on the, uh, residential don't have uh, any gardens. Cause, yeah, uh, when I think of composing, like, my friends have uh, a garden and they are doing it by themselves. But, uh, yeah, actually, you know, I'm, apartment and uh, you know oh, I won't be able to do it and kind of disappointed about, about it so maybe many people want to know more about you so I'm going to post uh, you on your website and <laughs> that's great and, uh, thank you yeah, and, uh, yeah you can actually selling uh, you are selling uh, well too so yeah I want to buy one <laughs> awesome. for, you know small garden so thank you yeah. so much for coming yeah. today thank you any other questions? Bruce or Sean yeah. or Nancy? How many um, employees do you have? Yeah, so that's a, that's, this is a thing I need to better incorporate into our presentation um, and is a thing that we take a lot of pride in. So um, by, the end of the, by the end of next month, we will formally convert um, to a worker-owned cooperative. Um, so the people on our team will have access to own the company alongside me and my fellow co-founder. Um, there are 16 of us that work, uh, that I work with. Um, and uh, I think that a, a thing that we, it's a mantra that we have internal, which is, you know, how we do this work is just as important as the work that we're doing. So I think that it's, um, in many ways, it's somewhat obvious that like what we're doing has environmental benefit. Um, but I think, um, we could also pay minimum wage. We could also not provide health care. We could also automate drones or something to go out and pick up buckets. And I think that we want to really be centering our work on how we can be building community and how we can be building wealth in communities that have historically been divested from. And so we have a starting wage of $20 an hour. We, um, we provide health care and benefits to everybody on our staff who's full-time um, and are now beginning to offer pathways to ownership for people on our team uh, who've been with us for three years or more. Dan, you do need to make that part of your story. I know, we really do. Part of your presentation, you really do. <clears throat> I have another question. Um, who are your uh, biggest customers? Yeah, so um, so big is measured, I think, in a couple of different ways, right? Um, we have um, we have some clients who have lots of locations. Uh, we have other clients that produce lots of material. Um, I think that um, well, this isn't fully rolled out yet, and um, not fully public either. So I'll ask you to um, just. Other notable, like, big clients are we work with the Cleveland Clinic, we work with university hospitals, we work with Case Western Reserve University. Um, and so, yeah, so a lot of the, like, larger anchor institutions. But, you know, to be totally honest, like, I come from the hospitality industry, and so I'm just as proud of working with the Phoenix Coffees, with, um, you know, small offices, uh, that, that we get to be part of, you know, I think that um, it's really cool to work with these big organizations, but um, to see a mom and pop restaurant prioritize this kind of service um, is really something special. Very nice. Last call for questions. 
Anyone? All right. Well, Dan, thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing your story, which is amazing and awesome. And we are all, I'm sure, groupies now. That's <laughs> so, great. Thank you so much. Um, and we look forward to learning much more about the services that you provide and also um, for these new conversations that you're helping to magnify um, in, in, across all networks and all communities. These are the, the things of the future, so the present yeah. and the future. So thank you. Thank you very, very much. Well, thank you so much for having me, and thank you for all the work that you're doing to help protect our natural spaces. You're welcome. All, all right. right. Have cool. a good evening. Yeah, you too. Take care. Okay. Thank you, Dan. All right. Awesome. All right. Well, here we go. Um, how did every, what did everyone think? Is that something that that topic interesting to you? Very interesting, and uh, I was wondering if it might be something that would be for you know a regular Audubon Tuesday meeting. Maybe, yeah, I guess. That, yes, that definitely, yes. Yeah. Um, and uh, were you good with um, making all the connections, or uh, what between uh, the 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 work that Dan does uh, with? with birds and habitat? Yeah. Okay, good. All right. Any other comments or questions? I um I do too. I think he would be a good Tuesday, like a speaker's meeting. Uh he's a very personable speaker and very likable and I, I think it's a a topic that's very uh it's apropos at this time because I think people are looking more. It's kind of one of those things. Um, Tom Romito always said that climate change is so huge for people to wrap their heads around that sometimes they just walk away from it. And here's a man who has started a business that says you can do your small part to keep your food out of landfills and at the same time make a product that's organic and um, improving soil. It's a really win-win situation, I think. I think it would be a great, a great meeting. I think we'd get a lot of people that would be interested in that. Yes, tying in, tying in the climate change, tying in the uh, just the tremendous amount of food wastage. That, you know, that just, just you know, I'm, I'm falling off my chair just thinking that is just terrible. Um, and, you know, and then having people in the city and around that, that don't have enough to eat. Um, you know, how can we tie that together? But, you know, we also have a lot of gardeners and things like that, that who may not know that these products are available once that composting is completed. So. And, and it's one of the biggest things that people complain about is that buying potting soil or even the products of, uh, they have something called cow now that kind of puts it all in and you get the manure and, and things like that. You just don't get a good product. Uh, the other thing, Nancy, that I thought was very interesting about that food waste was everybody seems to tell us it's the farmers. It's the farming. That's the big problem that we have with these greenhouse gases. But then you look at it and residents are 40%, businesses are 43%, and farms are 16%. So it's kind of like, whoa, wait. <laughs> you know, I realize that they do the pesticides and that, but it it's not quite what we I think we'd all be real surprised at what grocery stores get rid of, um, produce-wise, as well as maybe some, you know, packaging, package stuff. If people are klutzy and drop, you know, boxes of cereal and they're all crunched, uh, you know, people aren't going to buy them. So I, I, I think we'd be really, again, we'd be floored at the amount of, of waste. I agree. It would be we'd be smart to uh, learn more about this and bring this knowledge and the service closer to the people who are buying our, and wanting to purchase our native plants. Right, exactly. So that yeah. they can have extraordinary gardens 
um, that you know that are just uh, uh, wonderful uh, oases for birds. Um, all right, very good. Well, thank you. We're going to go on now. Um, for uh, just for two seconds, I'd like to just for the sake of declaring some simple rules. Um, I took a stab at drafting these. Uh, if you have suggestions for improvement, that's great. But let's let's try them on for size right now. So um, in, in this group, um, these are good things to remember. I think uh, number one is when you're talking about your project, um, just give us a quick update on your project, uh, five to seven minutes or less. Um, talk about the things that you're really excited about, the successes, the challenges. And then most importantly, uh, conclude with, you know, if you can, uh, think about or tell us what do you need or what do you want so that this uh, community, this group, uh, this network can respond with constructive solutions and, uh, and constructive action to help you do what you want to do. The um, second thing is offer constructive feedback. Get contact information and follow up with people. And you notice on last week and on subsequent slides, uh, I'll always try to uh, list a contact or a person who is a project leader. And if it's not there, ask me or ask someone else and we'll get it for you. So we really want to uh, knit the networks, as we say. We want to get those relationships and those contacts flowing. Um, third thing is our report progress. It's a good idea to report progress to the group at the next meeting. I know last week we talked, I talked uh, on behalf of uh, Karu, I believe, uh, about the native plant sale. And uh, if we could, uh, we'll, uh, Karu will talk today to give us some more updates on that. So keep the information coming so that the group is informed uh, and we can learn about the growth and get just excited about it as you are. Uh, and then the fourth thing is invite a friend. Invite a friend. These are public hosted spaces by WCIS for remote conversations, learning, and working. Uh, and there are wonderful spaces and we're very fortunate to have them. So we want to build our network out. We want more people. More people means great work done, more work done, and everything. So, all right, I'm going to go on. Next slide is, um, this is our agenda or our list of projects and things that you've told me that you want to cover uh, tonight. Uh, and we'll do our very best to do that. So it's about 7.53. We did start a little late. Uh, and it's a few minutes before 8. So um, uh, last time we ended, um, we still had Guardians of Nature mission vision uh, that Bruce uh, Missig is talking about. Uh, we uh, didn't have enough time to cover that. Um, and so I'd like to put, I put that at the top of the list. However, I want to ask this group's uh, um, feedback and permission. I'd like to ask you, uh, because we do have Karu online now and her, her um, <laughs> Tsugumi is with her. So, and in consideration of that, would you allow uh, Karu to begin so that um, they can... I can go later. Thank you oh, so much yeah. for... Yeah. Are, are My right, husband so. finished uh, his meeting, so maybe that will be better later. All right. All right. Well, if you would like to, um, you know, just holler if you need to go. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. With so time. Much. All right. With time so that you can give us an update. All right. So, um, Bruce, would you like to begin then? Uh, and I have a doc. I have your document I can show on share on my screen that everyone can see it. Uh, and this is concerning a garden, Guardians of Nature mission vision. It's just, it's a discussion draft. And I believe that Bruce would like to introduce it and share it. Um, and I would assume is asking for feedback uh, for improvements and how can we, what can we do and how can we help him to make progress uh, on this uh, for all of us. I'll share my screen. Hang on. 
Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry, hang on. I'm taking I think maybe it's your um, that we're hearing blocks being played with. Is there a possibility that it could be muted? All right. Sorry for the wait. Here we are. Can everyone see the document? Mm -hmm. You a little bigger. Um, I'm up to my maximum, 200, and I don't believe this, this, um, the Google Doc allows me to, um, you know, display it, I may be wrong, but display it full, full view. Um, would you like to introduce it to us, Bruce? Okay, I sat down with my friend George, who has a desire to do something, and he has a very good skill of writing, and he likes to write. So I told him what my ideas are and what I was thinking of. So he put a quick mission statement together and he put a vision statement together for us to be reviewed and gone over to see what people's feelings are or if that's in the right direction. To promote and appreciate and to develop responsible stewardship for the animate world and the inanimate world that supports it on a local level that encourages participation and cooperation by all sectors of society, regardless of age, income, gender, social status, education, race, ethnicity, creed, or political views. Thank you. What does everyone think? Any feedback off the top of your head? I thought it was very good that uh, the uh, inclusivity was uh, included in there because of uh, the diversity, the ethnicity, and the equality, because that is one thing that National Audubon Society is, is uh, wanting us to do. Um, the, and I have uh, two other things, and one is, I've read this already, and I thought the vision statement was very, oh, I have three things. The vision statement was really good, but I think for readability, I think if the one, two, three, four, and so forth could be used as like maybe uh, a line, like each one gets, one and then you skip a line, uh, you skip and do a two and a three. It would be much more readable. And then um, on number four, it, uh, as has an extra S, uh, as appropriate. I changed that, it. That, okay. I added your S. And, and then the only other uh, suggestion I had, I think that it is important that we uh, 
have a mission and vision statement for guardians, but it is an outgrowth of Western Cuyahoga Audubon. Uh, somewhere I think that there should be some mention that guardi what Guardian of Nature is, like it's an outgrowth of uh, the conservation lab and that it is a committee of Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society. And as such, I think that just as you said that we will uh, abide by all federal, state, and local laws, I believe we should also mention that uh, the board, the WCAS board is our governing, bo governing body. That was the only thing that I saw that I thought was missing. It made us seem like we were our own entity and I think we need to be sure that we make sure everyone understands that we are part of WCAS and that the board uh, is our governing body. That is all I had. I just felt for readability that I thought if you did one, two, three, four as bullet points or um, make it a list uh, for uh, a point on each each line or series of lines. Good. Thank you. Anyone else? So are we editing this now? Sort of adding some top of mind. The okay. Well, this is the first I've seen it, and I'm not. I'm you know I'm just a guest here tonight. Um, I don't, the very first line under the mission statement, to promote an appreciation for and development of responsible stewardship. Nice mm -hmm. addition. And development of, development. Um, this was on, uh, attached to, uh, Betsy's reminder, but you may have been busy today, and Nancy. And I also, it's a shared document, isn't it, that yeah. uh, Nancy can go and read at her uh, convenience uh, and offer anything else that she might see. Yeah, that would be great. Anyone else? Yeah, I agree in listing the one, two, three, four as either bullet points or, you know, separate them out a little bit. So. They can be because edit. I I love. Easily. What do you are you okay with that, Bruce? Mine by me. Okay, I can. I'll just kind of put in quickly a edit, um, rough edit. Um, and do you want them numbered or bulleted? Anyone? I think the numbers is, is good. Numbers is fine. Yeah, I, mean, I don't think. It, yeah, I don't think that matters. Any matter. Oh, okay. I just thought it was easier to read if sure. they were. Uh, yeah, it'll, it'll make it a little. Um, I won't fuss with the formatting too much right now, but yeah, you, it's enough for you to get the idea. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I also see when you're finished there. Sure. Um, gosh, where did it go? Oh. Under number three, guardians uh -huh. do not seek or guardians does not seek to replace other environmental groups. Uh, I don't know. What does the group think? Um, it should be singular. Guardians is a, a group. Uh, okay. So I think it should just, be... It just uh, sounds uh, uh, kind of awkward, but it doesn't matter. Okay. You know what, though? You're right. Because it does sound awkward, we should do does. All right. Uh, I, I see where it is, but... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it's awkward. I know. I, so, yeah, right. we should, yes. So it should be does. Anyone else? Any other suggestions? Good. I, you didn't get six, but I think... That, that uh, oh, there it is. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I I um I don't think we need the end. Uh -huh. Okay. 
I don't know what. Bruce, what do you think? Do you think we need the end? Mm -hmm. I think it was more of a funny pun. Yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. So, so what um, Gloria had suggested uh, that we need to um, work a little bit more on, on the copy to include um, the WCAS board as a governing uh, body. That was one and uh, that, that this is an outgrowth of the conservation lab. Is everyone good with that? Anybody? The um, only reason I'm saying fine. Okay. I, I the only reason I'm going to explain why I said an outgrowth of the conservation lab, I I we did this in response to David Lindo's The Guardians of Nature and our advocates uh component, but I I don't want to lose sight of the fact that we are an outgrowth of conservation lab that was based on face-to-face -face meetings um, and that this has been the change because we're now in a virtual world. So I just think that it would be nice to do that because sometimes I think the history is important and uh, organizations lose their history as people change and and things change but good all right it'd be nice to have uh, the guardians of nature I have a blurb a little blurb on that about um, the naming uh, uh, the you know the naming component which is is kind of interesting and lends a little more meaning uh, for newcomers all right very yeah good um, last call is there anything else you'd like to discuss about this or can may we move on and who would like to, is there anyone here who would like to uh, work with Bruce to uh, refine the edits and update the document for next month for us to look at it or to, or to email it to everyone? Well, well I will. I'll, I'm volunteering. Anyone else? Oh. Well, George will still be working with you too, right, Bruce? George is in the background talking to him, working with him. <laughs> okay, good. Okay. All right. All right, so. excellent. Well, thank you so much. This is uh, an awesome tool and an awesome frame and organizing frame for for uh, for anyone who comes and anyone who's here. Um, that's, that's really wonderful. All right, let's go back. I'm going to go back to uh, our slide deck and see what's next. Um, whoops. All right, just a minute. All right, there we are. Next one up is uh, the, oh, Amanda. Is Amanda still here? Amanda? Hi. All right, I'm not seeing. Yeah, Amanda? You keep bouncing in and out. Is it your network? Uh, I don't know. Me? Like, I, I don't see you, Amanda, but that's okay. Maybe other people can, and I can hear you. You're next. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, project, um, a couple of uh, what the requirements are for um, support for my um, and, uh, uh, um, so they're thinking. Uh, she's breaking up really yeah. badly. I'm not hearing much of anything. Amanda, we're, we're not hearing you. Are you able to log out and log back in or, or um, do something to get closer to your Wi-Fi signal? Okay. Amanda? All right. Um, I'm gonna. Oh, okay. I think she's trying to do just that. Um, while this is, uh, we're working on repairing her connection. 
uh, Nancy, would you like to go on and talk about your IBP? I'll text Amanda about yeah. that, that uh, if she doesn't mind, if she could go after you. Go ahead, Right, please. right. Thank you. Um, the latest newsletter had, I believe, had some information on this Institute for Bird Populations. Um, they run bird banding stations uh, in here in North America but are expanding their, their reach down to Central and South America with a project called MOSI, MOSI, and uh, monitoring something, something, something. Um, but basically it's bird banding down in Central and South America where our, our neotropical migrants are here during the summer but spend their times down in uh, Central and South America throughout the fall and winter. So the banding going on um, is taking place primarily in Nicaragua. There are four banding stations. And this is uh, a project through um, uh, um, bleh, I'm trying to think now. Oh my gosh. Um, it's all right. Take your time. Oh, the Ohio um, Council. Um, <coughs> Oh my gosh, I'm, I'm losing my mind. Um, what the heck is it called? COAC. COAC, thank you. Council of Ohio Audubon Chapters. Yeah, jeez. Um, so the, many of the chapters in COAC are uh, donating uh, some funds to help uh, run one of the stations down in, central, or down in Nicaragua. Uh, for a season, it's going to run $3,500 to get the supplies and get the, the um, uh, people on board. Um, so, again, as a conservation project, um, you know, we're trying to raise funds for that MOSI, the, the South American banding station. And uh, funds from Western Cuyahoga, we, we pledged $500. Um, other chapters have pledged $500, some $250, some $750. So it just depends, uh, again, getting that $3,500 together for, for the banding station. And what, what will be even better is the banding stations do have Internet access. Uh, and so we we'll, can give a presentation at some time, whether it's during the banding season in winter uh, or maybe afterward. Uh, but and, and and they can do it in they can do it bilingually as well. So they'll have uh, Spanish as well as English uh, speakers. So so that could be a real plus for for us as well as other COAC chapters uh, to hear from what's going on in, in uh, Central America. Um, Nancy, you were talking about fundraising for this. Um, Michelle put out about uh, Black River having that raffle, the, right. the raffle for their project. And then she was asking about the things that Betsy has in storage uh, for uh, the silent auctions right. and she was asking if she thought we could do some kind of raffle uh, as uh, Black River did and I from what I remember of what we have um, I think you remember too uh, we had one of uh, the members who brought all these things that she had had that were that she never used and she was moving and so she brought them to us and right. we did sell some of those things but there's a lot of that left I mean and we have books um, sure. Amanda has given a lot of books so I really think um, and Mich Michelle said could we do something for a conservation project like Guardians <laughs> of Nature or the bird population uh, the International Bird Banding Station. And my feeling is, I mean, Guardians of Nature is kind of like what I think the junior membership, but I think we'd be better off looking for sponsors for that, like 
maybe getting corporate like 150 250 and do a raffle i think it would probably be a good part of a fundraising campaign for um your project of the bird yeah yeah the bird funds have to be yeah the funds really should be pulled together by june 15th to send to uh uh, Institute for Bird Populations. But that's okay. I mean, we can take funds out of our treasury and then, the, again, what we Put can say for the whatever uh, uh, auction or whatever we do um, is that the yes, they will be going towards, yeah. That makes just such a, yeah. fact, you've heard me say this before, it's such an awesome social cause. It has so many interesting aspects to it. I know you didn't, you didn't you didn't explain as much as you did, um, uh, Nancy, about the project as you did, what was it, the last speaker meeting, or I've forgotten when, but you, you went into greater detail about, about um, the projects, the organizations, the possibilities, and, and the value of supporting these inner global networks. Right. And from a science perspective, I thought it was really powerful. Yeah. Again, it, it, it was in the last newsletter. I'm not sure how much got into this new newsletter that just came out. Um, but yeah, it, this does also uh, work with the population uh, wherever in Nicaragua and the villages. They do hire people. They do education to for the families uh, at how important it is to save the tropical regions uh, for the neotropical migrants. There was one banding station that I really, really wanted to have us support or have um, uh, COAC support. It was on a uh, uh, one of the, the uh, coffee farms. Ooh. Yeah, but uh, that one has already been funded, and I guess the, the, the people who own that, that coffee plantation um, are you know kind of supporting that one so cool. but that would have that would have been kind of fun because that could have tied in the birds and beans and everything else well maybe another one will, will surface yeah exactly good all right thank you does anyone else have any questions or comments for Nancy all right and if you'd like to get involved um, uh, contact Nancy who is the leader on on the yep. uh, the project and we'll have more updates in May um, and we can also email uh, a group or something about it if that works for you. All right, are we good? I think so. All right, good. Thank you. Uh, all right, Amanda, hi. Hi. I hope it's better now. It is. Your you audio me? is your okay. audio is a little low. If you can. Um, Either speak louder or turn up your audio. That'd be great. Okay, I'll have to speak louder. That's better. Uh, how's That's that? Great. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, shoot. So far, I've, um, as I said, I've uh, been contacted by a couple of Boy Scout troops, and I told them uh, what they needed to do as far as size of the of the um, the tower and our requirements but the biggest stumbling block is that I require that they put the tower on um, public land um, and so that requires more work for them but um, it is what it is um, I it just recently the city of Bay Village finished the tower in uh, Walker Park oh, and put cool. the sign up and um, as soon as they dig the, around it, I'm going to put native plants and I hope talk them into putting a little sign up there with an explanation. So, um, actually, um, uh, Betsy came to me this afternoon and talked about uh, getting a, um, a document for a uh, request for proposals and um, I think that's a really good idea because, you know, I haven't had much inquiry. And uh, so people, you know, probably part of the problem is people just don't know that there's another person out there that might help them finance a tower. 
So um, I'm going to need a little help on what it requires to make a, um, a request for proposals. But um, I actually have a list of requirements already that I can put in the document and um, maybe talk to I mean, what, what's everyone's opinion about requiring that we put it on public land? I always thought that that was the best thing because you could spend $600 to put a tower up and then they move and the next person just cuts it down. So that's why my feeling was it should be on public land, um, period. I mean, what, what does everyone think of that? No, no strong opinions? Okay. <laughs> Land and the... Sounds like a good idea. The, the, I think that it's a good idea to do it. Um, yeah. I, I think it should be public land because then you're going to have something in a document at a city council or in a township or whatever it is that this is what it is, what its purpose is, why it's there, and then you're more likely to have it stand longer. Yeah. Uh -huh. I agree. Okay. I think your public land is a, a good idea. Okay. Amanda, if it were put on private property, um, what, what, what are, are people thinking about, like their backyard or, or what? Yeah, I think, I think so. Um, like I, the, the troop leader, I think was thinking in one of them was thinking like, oh, we could do this fast. We'll put it like in my backyard, and we're done. And but you know, who knows? I mean, he could turn around and say, oh, I got a new job, so I'm moving. And then that's six hundred bucks down to if somebody else tears it down, like they did with the tree in Bay Village. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, a public a public land again to get the word out, and again if there's signage, uh, just so people people will understand what what this thing is, and then they might want to build one for their own backyard in the future. I forgot to add about the sign. I'll add that. It's one of the yeah, requirements. Good insight. Um, I, while you were talking, I was thinking, Bruce, you've done a lot of uh, public advocacy work, like. Haven't you between residents or community or and there may be other people here as well, but um, what crossed my mind uh, when Amanda was speaking was um, I'm curious what kind of documents or um, uh, communications would uh, would would a sit a, 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 a uh, an applicant that's funded out of Amanda's RFP uh, need. Uh, to present such a project uh, to their city council uh, uh, for public land. So, um, yeah, you might be helpful in that. Am I accurate, Bruce, or not? I really haven't done ad advocacy oh. on that level. Uh -huh. All I can say is that if you put it on private land, you can always put a deed restriction oh. which says they can't take it down. Yeah, I think that that's a lot more, I mean, that would require legal assistance mm -hmm. and it's a lot more in-depth that I know I want to go into and probably most people do too. So, but it, it's an option I think we could present to them. All right. Well, Another thing, I was just thinking that, you know, we never require any kind of a contract and um, just, and it always bothers me just handing 600 bucks out to somebody that you don't know and um, lately I've been saying that I'll only give the money, I'll only write a check to the, the uh, troop, not give it to like a person, a, a individual, yeah. kid or his mother or something. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I hope that at least then we'd have more of a chance of the project actually getting done. We haven't had a problem with that yet, but um, we've only put up, I think, one through a 
through a scout group. Maybe it's two. But um, it, it's always kind of bothered me a little bit just handing somebody that I don't know all that money. So. Well, I I think you're right, Amanda, that there should be a, like a, a like a time schedule of, you know, when you'll have the materials, you know, and then instead of giving it to the person, just maybe write the check to wherever they buy it, or if they get those donated and they need it for something else, that there's like a timeline of and when the work will be completed. And, um, mm -hmm. and this kind of project, they need the money before the project is completed. But I agree with you. There should be something spelled out of that you've won this proposal and here are the terms. And that, yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's a good thing. And if it's for a scout who's 17 and not 18 yet, an Eagle Scout, it'd be a good idea to have any guardian uh, sign as well mm -hmm. or the troop leader, whoever the responsible adult is going to be. Yeah, I, I agree. You do need that uh, in your scope of of what you're doing here with your request for proposal. But I think it's a really a great idea. Um, get the word out. Say that you have X amount of dollars for um, a tower, and you know you want to make one. You know, here's here's the specs, and put up your proposal. You know where it's going to be, whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Anybody else before we move on? Amanda, was that helpful to you? Yeah, it is. I've got some extra good ideas of what I need to add. Good. Okay. Um, and keep us posted either through email or perhaps uh, next month. You um, might come back, follow up, and share uh, what your uh, what progress you've made. Awesome. All right. Thank you. All right, um, I'm just real quick, uh, next thing on the list are virtual field trips. Uh, Michelle Brocious um, has a class, I understand, on Thursday evenings and is not able to join us. I did mention this last week and I want to mention it again. So the virtual field trips are um, uh, the adaptation of the traditional field, field trip uh, that WCAF hosts and these are, are um, you know, monthly locations that, uh, birding locations that are identified. The invitation is put out for the, the month, each month, and each month is a different location. Uh, and then people can go to do DIY. You go there at any time that you wish, how many ever times you wish to go and bird. And people are encouraged to contribute their, um, their you know, documentation if they have it, or photography, or bird lists, or poetry. Uh, to, uh, to Michelle for uh, the following, the next month's uh, virtual meetup. And then from there, uh, Michelle curates a really amazing uh, digital scrapbooks of all of the different contributions. So uh, one request that she had again for us is to um, maybe think about how we can get help her to get more people to attend the monthly online meetups. Um, and um, uh, so that more people can come uh, and does anyone have any ideas about that to help her grow her online program? So uh, I have one suggestion. Okay, thank you. Uh, since uh, Michelle's Instagram has been like uh, good, yeah, growing well, so she can like add a like news blog, a monthly field trip on the, you know, Instagram post, I mean, her post. Good. Then, then, you know, anyone can attend to the following meetup, even though they are not going to the place. Yeah, that, exactly. That was kind of my, I, uh, where I was going to Karu. It maybe start saying to people, you know, if you didn't have a chance to 
sign up for the uh, the virtual bird trip, still come to the online meeting meetup to find out what what it's like and what people bring back and what they do, and maybe go from that that way. You know, come to the meetup first before you you know jump in with both feet and take a hike in one of the preserves and look for birds and um you know i i don't go to uh i haven't had the chance because of the baby to go visit the preserves but i really like to go to the meetups and listen to what everybody tells me about what they saw what they did uh how many species there were and all of that so I was thinking maybe, like Carew says, go start at what we thought was the uh, culmination as also the beginning. Make it like a circular thing that, you know, if you don't get to go to, if you don't get to sign up, you don't get to go, still come to the meetup if you've never been to this preserve, you know, because then you may want to. That was the only idea I really thought of as well and to use that Instagram that she's uh, really just that thing is just blossoming yes. mm -hmm. and I also suggest uh, like uh, we can have uh, a kind of uh, community uh, focusing on virtual field trips like uh, we have a quick Japanese meetup on meetup group some people really don't want to belong to like uh, a formal organization <laughs> so but uh, still you know uh, many people want to like join in you know get into like a uh, kind of events uh, without uh, you know uh, scheduling so yeah I will suggest like we can have like a separate group on uh, another platform and, and actually it's you know hosted by WCS but uh, you know people don't see it by WCS so yeah sorry to say that but yeah some people really hesitate to like yeah I don't know but yeah I'm not the person but <laughs> so I, I put the link on it thank you that's great all right all right and then um well, your your answers kind of answered um, uh, the the next question. What can guardians do? Uh, and so, thank you for all of your responses. Now, uh, Karu, would you please go next? Ah, friendly native plant or myself. Ah, okay. So we just finished our April April cell, and we uh, finally delivered the native plants to our customers on uh, what was the day and uh, last Friday uh, and uh, Amanda and Nancy helped uh, uh, me to uh, deliver the things to the customers and uh, yeah Gloria might have received it and so yeah it's uh, the, the uh, we the, all the plants. Uh, thanks to Beth says marketing. Uh, thank you so much for email, newsletter, and uh, news blogs, other uh, posts. Because uh, I'm sure they see them and uh, buy it. So, uh, so so we already had uh, May sales on website. Uh, Beth say uh, had the page. Uh, this week, and uh, actually already we had uh, a customer bought uh, five seed boxes, so it's really doing uh, great. Um, maybe uh, and uh, we are selling uh, five kinds of plants, and each plant have uh, uh, each plant has five quantities, so uh, 25. Uh, Quantities in total, and uh, in April, we have six locations. 
and uh, by three people, you know, delivered by three people, that was uh, like enough for now. So if we can have more volunteers, we might uh, be selling uh, more. But uh, for now, it's it's worth to sell. And you know, we don't know like uh, how many locations we have uh, next month. So if you can uh, help us. Uh, uh, pick up the plants and uh, drop off the plants, that would be great. And uh, uh, we are buying native plants from uh, Nodding Onion Nursery in Columbia Station. Thank you. Thank you, Karu. All right, so you we have, have for, yeah. sorry, looking for drivers. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. I interrupted. Did you have something uh, more yeah, you no. wanted to say? Do you have uh, any suggestions of, uh, or opinions on this uh, topic? Um, I just want to say that I wish I had bought all three of the plants that were left because <laughs> I love uh, the two golden rods that I received. And thank you, Karu. I'm sorry I missed you. But they are really good plants. And I'm yeah. really excited. Actually, I'm going to. Yeah, actually, the quality was better than we sold at the farmer's market because uh, Beth from Nutting Onion tells us, like, we are, and uh, when the plants are ready, we pick them up. So that's why the yeah, quality was great. Like, the plant yes. had uh, many buds. So, yeah, I love that, that plant. They were very good. Mm hmm. Yeah, I, when I saw the plants, I'm like, wow, these are really nice. Mm -hmm. So um, I believe that we got at least one good-sized order for the wild petunia, which I think is being sold for in May. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Is that mm -hmm. a May plant? Yes. Yeah. So far, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, it, I, it is sold out now. Yeah, <laughs> that's what, I think she bought them all. Right. And yeah. Uh, so, but it was one of the same people that we delivered to in in April. So apparently, she's oh, okay. pleased with the uh, with the plants. Mm -hmm. And one of the one of the customers in May uh, made the cutest video. I hope you had a chance to see it. I posted it on the Facebook. <laughs> yeah, I page. saw it. Thank you. And the the bags look the delivery looks so cute, <laughs> so so nice to receive. You know. Uh, and the plants mm -hmm. were so lovely looking. So, really good work, I think. Mm -hmm. um, right. Yeah, if we have uh, like repeaters, like repeat uh, consumers uh, eat plants, uh, yeah, we need to consider like subscription or whatever, you know, for next year. What was that last part, Karu? Uh, like, if we have uh, like repeaters, like same person buying the uh, each month, you know we can consider like kind of subscription, like native plants oh, subscription excellent. for yeah. next year. Oh. Yeah, then you know uh, people have uh, like native plants each month, like mm -hmm. five kinds of plants or something like that. Yeah, what that would be great. Idea. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, awesome. Anyone okay. else? All right. Um, it's 8:39. We did start a little late, um, so we're we're continuing just for a few more moments. Uh, Darina, would you like to proceed now with updates on the book club? Sure. Um, we had our Sunday evening discussion group last Sunday. And thanks for everybody who participated. We learned about some new authors from Amanda, and um, I'm glad Gloria was there. Um, I have one contact right now for a potential author, and uh, hoping that he will um, he will be able to uh, fit in with our schedule. His name is Neil Hayward. He wrote the book. Um, Life Among the Birds, which uh, I had read twice, actually, and talked about it at one of our um, online book meetings last year. So I was excited about that. Um, looking for other authors and getting a schedule in order. And um, 
you know, like what, what Michelle was saying in her section about how can we get more people to attend um, this group and get it uh, well established. And I think I said last week, um, it, it, it seems like there's so much competition for everybody um, for activities, especially, you know, maybe not especially, but I think online there are so many things. Next Thursday night I have three potential activities all at the same time. But um, so there's not a whole lot new since last week, but uh, moving along. Very good. Thank you. Um, we have just a few minutes left. Uh, the um, the next topic has to do with fundraising. Uh, and looking ahead, I w would like us to finish uh, at 8.45 uh, so that people don't get tired. Um, and so I'm going to ask this group and Gloria uh, if, if we could uh, just maybe talk about this briefly and then continue either I prefer in another meeting um, uh, if people would like to attend so that we could do that. Uh, the fundraising plans are happening quickly. We need your feedback. We need your insights. Uh, so I don't know. What, what would you like to do? Um, the spring membership campaign, um, I don't know if that document draft, we wanted to start that uh, in the beginning of uh, May so that we could take advantage of Mother's Day and Father's Day as possible new members, mothers and fathers as possible new members. And um, last week we decided that uh, we would concentrate in the spring on new members that we haven't had before, then that we might do a two or three week, probably more like a two week early bird and maybe give a discount to the $40 and the family, all of the different things, but uh, then have our regular uh, membership that we do for September, for August and September. So, um, that's where we're kind of at with that. And what I'd like to do, if everybody is okay, I would, there is this uh, spring membership thing, uh, document on... Uh, I'm, I'm trying to pull it up now. That's okay. Uh, I couldn't pull it up. Document, document uh, on the shared Google Drive. And I'd like to share it with each and every one of you so that you could comment on it and make your uh, comments and suggestions uh, for what we do in the spring membership and then also we want to announce it uh, next week because Mother's Day is the 9th of May so I also have a uh, short announcement that uh, I'm going to try to make into a letter for uh, MailChimp people and our MailChimp list and I'll be sending that to all of you plus our board members uh, for their suggestions so if you all would just uh, look tomorrow to see that I think that any other things that I had on the fundraiser unless somebody else wanted to talk about it uh, that we could uh, do that at an, a later time if that's okay with everybody uh, instead of, I think everybody's pretty tired now and that we could all just talk. And if anybody wants to call me, uh, my phone number is 216-531-5341. No, wait. 5341? I can't remember my number. 5314. Uh, anyway. Email me and I'll call you because <laughs> it's right there. I started um, I started a uh, spring membership letter. Since, oh great! You know I'm, I'm on the, the I'm the membership chair, so um, sure. I will share that with everybody. Is uh, how is this list uh, the guardians list? Is there like a group list, or do I have to put each individual name, or just? 
find find where the the uh, stuff was shared for this meeting tonight and just uh, attach it to there. Is that what I do? Okay. Um, probably send me the information and then I'll send it out. Okay. Um, yeah. So this yeah. again, it's, it was a first stab at at membership, um, and then we can add the Mother's Day information or add you know put that in. And I did not know what kind of price uh, the group was thinking of, so that's that's the kind of thing. Yeah. That we're, okay. We're, well, the price is going to be it's not going to be any different than what it is in the fall. Okay. It's not a it's not a discounted price. Maybe. Okay. This is more for new members. Okay. People that we may know that have come to some of the meetings and the presentations, and we're going to try to pull them as in as members. Okay. All so righty. this is a new member kind of thing uh, that we want to do. So it's going to be the same price as everybody else's, but what we wanted to do was we have a, a, a raffle that we want to do, and I'll, I'll send you that. Um, I don't know if it's here. I, I really think that we sh we should agree to convene at an at another time. Yeah. Well, then we could do that. It certainly yeah. merits it, and there's a lot yes. of discussion and uh, to coordinate I, and to get ideas. And there's so a lot of back end work that's happening now. So Betsy, I think that what we need to do is maybe put out uh, here or three times that you know. What time is good I'll for everybody, that. and then we'll choose that or something. Very good. Very so good. I think that's the way we ought to do it. But we need to really hop on this uh, yeah. early or this spring membership, I think, if we're going to get any get anything out of it. And we can Great. do it for Mother's Day, Father's Day. We can kind of do that. Uh, friends and family that you know that are backyard birders mm -hmm. and are interested in uh, backyard retreats and things like that. And uh, I started to do something today. So, Nancy, I'll send that out. You send, uh, well, you know what, Betsy, you have mine. So just get Nancy's and then send it out to everybody. Yep. Yeah. And you then they can, yep. how's that? And you then they'll be it, together. You wanted it info at Betsy or? It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, it'll be, I'll be sent out to everyone from info at. So. Okay. All right, awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, I know you're all tired, so this is the time I really want to ask you before we sign off. How did you like having a, a new conversation uh, that uh, for 30 minutes, uh, conversation, discussion, presentation uh, at the opening of these uh, project sessions? I enjoyed it. I thought it was, I, it also was so excellent. It's meant to invigorate and, and help us continue learning. I liked it a lot. Um, maybe it doesn't have to be every guardians meeting, um, okay. but, but you know, every every so often to to energize. Yes, good. Bruce, how about you? Bruce, what was your reaction? A lot of information. If you have to schedule your meetings longer than an hour, you bring on a guest speaker. They, they are. They're 30 minutes plus the hour. They're front end loaded. <laughs> All right. Drina? Yeah, I thought it was excellent. And um, yeah. Okay. Sean, I think you came a little later. Um, uh, Amanda, what, what, what is your reaction? No, I liked it. I thought it was a really good uh, talk to have. All right, good. Uh, we may shorten them up a little bit, you know, as much as possible, but definitely no longer than 30 minutes. All right, thank you, everyone. Have a nice evening. Thanks, and, Betsy. Uh, look for information, and uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. We got a lot done tonight. Good, good. Well, we can't do it without everyone. That's right. Thank you. Good night.